you? Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. My name's Lacey. I'm calling all the way from Kenora, Ontario. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. We're sort of new to ducks, my husband and I. This is our first winter uh, with them. We got them last spring. Okay. So just kind of wanted to learn about um, the incubation stuff, just to see if we want to do that or not, because I'm a little weary about it. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's... Lots of people have said it's it's not that hard. The geese can be a little harder, depending on the breed, but... Ducks are pretty, they're pretty easy pretty overall. Easy. Call ducks could be pretty hard, but I mean. Yeah, yeah. we have three call ducks, but um, one was the mom that we got from another farm, and the two um, babies were hatched in a nest, and we got them when they were like a week old or something, so um, they're all fine and good. And then we just got um, Dale's ducklings chickens from bird hatchery in Manitoba. Okay. Um, and we have, uh, we just have one net? No, we have two, two chickens. We had four rock teeth or coyotes, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So you're getting there with duck math then, eh? <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. And then, um, and actually the four, I ordered four chickens, and we ended up with three hens and one drink. It was like, wow. how did this happen? We felt so lucky. And so we were devastated when we lost the two hens to the coyote. Oh, um, no. Yeah. And then we got another older pecan, um from a farm in Dryden, Ontario. Um, and then uh, she came with a mix something i don't really know what she is <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they all live happily even in minus 40 weather Oof. yeah yeah yeah, yeah they're, pretty, they're, 40. they're pretty hardy little birds actually for yeah time. they really are mine live yeah, in my they're basement still laying eggs. they're still laying eggs out there every morning we go collect them like it's great yeah <laughs> Ours usually lay all through the winter too. Like they'll slow down a little bit, but they'll they usually continue to keep laying. This last year's been a little different for us, um, yeah. but but I know Heidi sometimes gets eggs through the winter too, right? Yeah, yeah. It depends on what breed it is too, right? Like I mean, some of them might just take a break for the winter and start up in the spring and but usually I'm pretty good about getting eggs all winter yeah 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 we're interested in Welsh charlatan it's kind of our next thing we would like to add well, they're really nice and they, they love it <laughs> I like my Welsh the Welsh are really good egg layers yeah I like my Welsh. They're also a really friendly breed too. Like they're they're pretty laid back. We were hoping because you can actually Welsh harlequins are they like the only duck you can actually get sex in their first hatch? Is that true? Yeah. yeah. If you can find somebody who's selling them sexed, they can auto sex them off the bill color. Yeah. As long as they yeah. maintain that genetics through their breeding programs. Right, and I think I got onto your Facebook page from ACDC Farms in Manitoba. Oh, yeah, Abigail, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was kind of, she actually seemed to link to your page when I was talking to her on her page, and then that's kind of how I found you there, so. <laughs> yeah, I got my Welsh from Cassandra, actually. I got my okay. Welsh. <laughs> yeah. We've got the... Uh, the gold and silver jeans in our our Welsh's. Don't ask how it happened, but we've got it. It's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both. I think both of the phases are quite pretty in their own in their own ways. The golden's a little a little more rare. It was actually 
It was the first Welsh color, and then the silvers mutated from the golden phase. So, but mainly I see everybody has the the silver Welsh with that bright blue wing stripe. Yeah. But I guess I guess we can get started, and if anybody else comes on, yep. we'll just let them in or whatever. <laughs> So, um, basically for incubation, the information starts before you even start setting up the incubator. So it actually starts with your, your, your breeding flocks health. If mm -hmm. they aren't healthy, they don't have enough vitamins and minerals to pass into the yolks, which then can end up giving you weak ducklings or ducklings that have certain vitamin deficiencies so i always say that that's the main thing make sure you're feeding as balanced of a diet as you can which is hard because we don't actually have um a lot of what i would consider high quality feeds for waterfowl in canada yeah um it might be a little different over on the east coast but I've tried researching pretty much all. Where we are in Kenora, like super close to the Manitoba border, uh, we get, like, do I get my, it's Kenora Beddendale. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, but they're like a horse hotel kind of thing, and they have all different animals. And um, they have to get all their food from Western Canada. So it's the same sort of supplier because I've looked at getting specifically waterfowl food and it's just super hard to get. Yeah. So are you feeding country junction feed or is it just like I'm a chicken? Feed master feed. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So okay. so that's master feeds. Um, they have an all flock feed, right? Yeah. Or is it just straight up chicken? Yeah, and it's a layer feed that I'm feeding, um, and like most everyone feeds their wild or fowl. I feed yeah. lots of mealworms as well. So, yeah, yeah. Peas. Go ahead. Yeah, peas feed frozen peas. Or yeah, cherry peas. Peas. <laughs> cherry tomatoes and red grapes. <laughs> Those are my favorite. <laughs> That's awesome. So. Um, like Metzer Farm has a really good layout of nutrients that the birds should be getting if you're going to use them for um, breeding birds. Um, but the only other thing that I'd like to say is about the feed is usually a duck hen is only going to eat around six ounces of feed in the warm months. But in the cold months and through the breeding season, if you're not feeding free free choice, you should up that to about eight ounces per per hen. Um, your drakes can stay a little lower, but it's just for the extra energy and the extra nutrients and everything that needs to go into those eggs because those eggs need to be high quality, right? Mm -hmm. um, collecting and storing of the eggs. So yeah. you want to try to collect daily, of course. And you want to store air cell end up. We use an egg carton. And so we'll just tip one end up one day. And then the next day I'll tip, tip the opposite end up while storing. So that's so the yolk is moving from side to side because it's going to go to the, the high side of the egg. And if the yolk sits against the membrane, it can actually attach to the membrane. So then when you go to incubate, those ducklings will start to grow, but they won't be able to absorb their yolk effectively or properly. So a lot of those guys are gonna die. So they might die right at hatch or during hatch. Um, so I've found once a day is good enough. When I add new eggs in, I'll just tip it the opposite way. Um, we don't store for longer than seven days. I have gone longer I've gone all the way up to 14 days just to test and see there is usually a fertility dip around the seven days 10 days and then again at 14 days so there is a slight dip at five days as well but it's not that significant that we've noticed a huge difference 
Uh, and I always just take a pencil and I mark the date on the eggs. So which day they've been laid. And then since we also have multiple breeds, I'll mark the initial of the breed on it as well. Some breeds, you can totally tell the difference in the eggs, but certain breeds, they look very similar. And when they hatch, they can look very similar as well. So if you're gonna do two different breeds and you wanna make sure, say you ordered Welsh from me and the Saxony can look very similar to Welsh. So yeah. I don't wanna accidentally sell you purebred Saxony instead of the Welsh, right? So um, storing is best between 15 to 16 Celsius. You can go colder um, too much cold can also affect the fertility and or the hatchability of that egg. So um, Cornell University, like their veterinarian department of the, of the college, they've said that 15 to 16 Celsius is the best storing temperature while you're waiting to put them into the incubator. Um, and then before you put them into the incubator, we kind of increase our temperature slowly rather than just toss them into the incubator and all of a sudden they're going to go up to 37 celsius right so i'll bring them out of the cooler area and i'll put them in a warmer area of my house so that gets them up to room temperature yeah. and um so you just want to try to get them like slowly kind of warm them up and then get them into the incubator Going from room temperature to the incubator should be okay. I know Heidi said last time we did this talk that she'll put them on top of her incubator. Mm -hmm. And so she finds that helps warm them up, right? Yeah, because your temperature on there would be, you're probably sitting about 18 to 20 degrees on top of your incubator. Especially if it's already running, right? Like you've already got it set, preset for 37 inside, so it'll be warmer on top. Yeah. Where your vents are and stuff, because it's letting it out. Yeah. So, so that's a good idea, and that's just like a huge temperature change. Either way, can affect some of your, um, not not that the eggs aren't fertile, but it would be counted as the fertility rate right? because the hatch yeah. rates at the end, right? So it can affect those eggs and make them less viable to do huge fluctuations in the temperature. Then my next point is the incubator prep. So sanitizing is always essential. That's like one of the biggest things when it comes to the incubator, you wanna make sure it's sanitized well. We have done all kinds of things from vinegar and water, we've used essential oils, uh, Prevail, which is a uh, activated hydrogen peroxide. You can get it from your vet. Um, there's other cleaners you can get from your vet as well. You can use diluted bleach water, just, just anything to make sure that you're killing any of the bacteria that, that could have been in it while it was being stored through the winter or since your last hatch. Um, the higher temperature and the, and the higher humidity in the incubator is prime for bacterial blooms. So mm -hmm. if you're going to do multiple sets in a year, just make sure you're sanitizing in between those sets. Just clear it all out, the turner, everything, get it all nice and clean and then restart. And I suggest people run their incubators for one to two days and that you have at least one, if not two, uh, separate thermometer hydrometers that you can move around inside the incubator just so you can see if you have any hot or cold spots. Mm -hmm. But don't rely on the digital reader yeah. that the incubators come with because they are not gonna be accurate. I don't, we've never had no. one no. I have uh, an in farmer innovation innovation incubator. It's just a styrofoam one that you can buy off of Amazon for like two hundred bucks. And it's sitting I've got eggs in my incubator right now and the digital one on top says it's sitting at hundred and four 
but my thermometer ones that are inside the incubator are sitting at 37.6. Yeah. Yeah, they're, I think, pretty well known for not being very accurate for temperature and humidity. So you kind of want to get a two in one reader. Yeah. And then, like I said, just kind of move it around to all the different spots in the incubator. And then if you do have hot or cold spots, Try not to put your eggs there, but if you do have to, like you have so many eggs, you're going to fill the whole incubator, at least try to rotate them through. So, say your left is really warmer, a bit warmer, your middle's perfect and your right side's cooler, you will want to rotate them through each level. So, each day just kind of move them around so that they're sort of gonna get an even temperature if your temperature is too high you can have early hatches and if the temperature is too low you can have late hatches so mm -hmm. if the incubator is not very consistent you might have that hatch spread out over an entire week or mm -hmm. I've even heard of people like it took a week and a half or even closer to two weeks from when the first one hatched to the last one so you just want to try to be as consistent with the temperatures as you can. Um, you'll, you want it to be your incubator to be in as, as stable of a room temperature room as you can. So not where it gets super hot when the furnace is running and super cold before the furnace kicks in. I was going to ask that. Okay. Because yeah. the, the incubator will adjust. It will. But it takes time for it to get up to heat or down, right? So, <clears throat> sorry, it, it, it'll it fluctuate each time. And you kind of don't want your incubator in direct sunlight for the same reason, it'll heat up the incubator. So you just want to kind of try to avoid putting it in direct sunlight. And like I've, people have put them in like their laundry rooms and same thing. When you're drying your clothes, you're going to boost that temperature in that room. So like a, a bigger open room that the temperature is not such a huge fluctuation with the furnace for us in Canada anyways, <laughs> mm -hmm. you'll, you just want to pay attention to that. Then I guess next would be the egg prep. So people kind of do everything from not washing them to fully disinfecting them. Mm -hmm. And it's, some people swear by this method and other people swear by this method. So you're just going to have to kind of find what is right for you. Um, it, disinfecting them is going to remove the bloom of the egg. And when you remove that bloom, it does make it easier for bacteria to get into the eggs. So it can cause issues during incubation, in my opinion. But if your eggs are dirty and they got poop on them and you're putting that into the incubator, that's also can cause issues too, right? So either way you go, you wanna try to make sure they're the cleanest eggs. Um, some people use like an SOS pad and they'll just kind of rub on the egg, which can mark up the bloom a little bit, but it doesn't completely remove the bloom, so um, I use just a Norwex cloth with water and I usually clean mine like that. Like if I'm going to give them to somebody or whatever, um, generally I leave them dirty. Um, they're not usually too, too dirty because we get them so quickly. But um, yeah, I find the Norwex cloth does is fairly gentle, but it does get off like any sort of debris, but keeps the bloom without scratching it up too bad. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I do suggest if you're bringing in hatching eggs, like from somebody else's farm, you've ordered them in, that you do, they call it a peroxide spray or a peroxide dip. Um, so it's just basically it's five to six percent peroxide diluted into water and you'll just mist it onto the eggs. It shouldn't remove the, it shouldn't remove the bloom but it will kill a lot of the bacterias and 
some of the diseases like um, well, I can't think, Heidi. Micro, um, micro. <laughs> I can't even think of it now. <laughs> I can't either, right at this moment. Um, mycoplasma. Sorry. There you go. It it can come off the bird's dander onto the eggs. So then, okay. if you incubate them without cleaning them, when those ducklings hatch. If they get any of that dander on them that you might not even see, right? Then that right. then they can get it, and you you would infect your flock, right? Um, okay. So it's just that's that's what we do. If we bring any kind of hatching eggs in, we do that peroxide. I just spray it. So I'll spray it, and then when I turn them, I'll spray the other side of them, and while they're in the incubator, like I don't even. I don't do it b before I put them in or anything like that. Um, oh, I guess I should say, though, um, they are coming out with studies on the peroxide spray mm -hmm. and that it's actually increasing hatchability rates. So even if they're your own eggs, it, it's worth a shot if if you're not yeah. opposed to it like some people are opposed right. to doing things yeah. and i'm not i'm not saying don't do something you're not comfortable with but if you're right. not opposed to it you could give it a shot i'm actually trying it right now with my eggs is just cleaning them down with a little bit of peroxide and water or yeah. if i'm in the incubator i'm all about the science so <laughs> if it works <laughs> i'll let you know <laughs> yeah so they said it's it shows increased hatchability and decreased early stage death compared to the formaldehyde fumigation that hatcheries do. Mm -hmm. And then I found a few different studies. There was another one that talked about oregano juice. So for people who are more want to go with that natural product. Oregano juice at 50% proved to be as effective as formaldehyde fumigation on the bacterial load on the eggshells. It was also superior on chick quality score in the first two weeks after hatch, and those chicks consumed less feed. So basically, they're just saying it's as effective as the formaldehyde fumigation. And it's actually a little better for the offspring in the first two weeks compared to the formaldehyde fumigation. Heidi, do you have anything to add? To Not that? to the oregano juice, I'm good. <laughs> so then incubating. Um, again, this varies from person to person. There's auto turners. You can hand turn. Um, some people turn like on roller turners, so it rolls the egg sideways, or the tip turners, it'll turn them like this. Mm -hmm. Or some people hand turn this way, long end over long end, and they they swear it's a better hatch rate. Um, lots of people talk about it with geese eggs. I've never turned end over end like that, but I am gonna try with the geese this year and see if it makes any difference. Um, if you are going to hand turn though, the first week is the most important. So you mm -hmm. want to try to turn them as often as you can in that first week of incubation. Then you can, you can decrease after that, but, um, and you always want to make sure it's an odd amount of times you're turning. So it just goes back to that yolk sitting against the membrane on the long overnight of not being turned when we're sleeping, you don't want that yolk to end up in the same spot every single night because then it, it's more likely to attach to that membrane. So if you just do odd turns like three, five, seven, nine, however many times you want to turn them as long as it's an odd number. Um, I personally get better rates hand turning with the waterfowl eggs. Other people say the tip turners work better for their waterfowl or the rollers. So again, it's just going to come down to really what works for you. I think yeah. a lot of it is the incubators too. Um, yeah. 
no nobody's incubators are the same because our environments aren't the same right so your temperature for the incubator should be 37.5 um, for from day one all the way to lockdown you should try to keep it there now misting um, I've tried misting and not misting to see if it made any difference it honestly didn't make a difference for our duck eggs it does for geese eggs but for the duck eggs it didn't make I didn't have better hatch rates or anything like that uh, I do semi cool my eggs though it's not every day and the only reason I'm not purposely doing it though I, I chart the air cells on the eggs to know if I need to increase or decrease the humidity. So mm -hmm. I'll take all of my eggs out of the incubator so they do cool while I'm candling them and charting the air cells and then I put them back in. But I only do that on day um, 7, 10, 18, 21 and at lockdown. So it is not a daily cooling. Um, I have tried cooling daily in the past cooling then misting then putting back in and again it didn't didn't seem to make a difference for for us with the waterfowl eggs or let me correct that for the duck eggs it does make a difference with the geese eggs mm -hmm. um there are studies that are showing that if you decrease at lockdown if you drop your temperature 0.3 to one full degree so going down to 37.3 or even as low as 36.5, that it they've had better hatch rates in those studies with a little bit lower temperature during hatching. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to try that this year. I just found this study not long ago, so I can't comment on if I found it help, was helpful or not. And then humidity. And again, all the way from dry hatching to basically having the water drip off the incubator. Everybody does something different. I think location, your ambient humidity, all your house humidity, all of that's going to play in, into it as well. Mm -hmm. So um, Cornell University suggests that you incubate at... 55% humidity and then you hatch at what they say I had to look it up because we chart the air cells so I don't actually have like a set humidity that I do increase to 75 for hatching is what they suggest so the only thing I really kind of want to say about the humidity is don't go from 55 straight up to 75. Um, an egg will try to mimic its ambient environment. So if you bump up the humidity really high right away, that egg's gonna start pulling water into itself to increase its humidity. So at lockdown, some of those ducklings could already be in the air cell. And so if that egg starts pulling humidity into the egg, it's gonna go into the air cell and it can drown the ducklings. So we do a 10% increase. So right first at lockdown, I'll bump it up 10% compared to what I was incubating at. And then the second day of lockdown, I'll bump it up again. It doesn't, that makes sense? Yeah. Sort of, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, with the charting of the air cells, it, it's really easy. It's basically like weighing. Have you heard of the people who weigh the eggs to make sure they lose a certain amount of weight for hatch? Charting okay. the air cells is kind of the same. You just take your light, put it on the air cell, mark it with a pencil, and the air cell should grow a certain amount each week. So if mm -hmm. your air cell is growing too fast, then your humidity is too 
Hang on, I'm on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Your humidity is too low. And if the air cell's too small, the humidity is too high. So that egg's not losing enough moisture to allow that air cell to grow. Um, okay. It sounds hard. It's actually really quite easy if, if you decide to get into it. Um, and then I guess that's basically that's basically it for incubation. But I do have a couple of other points, um, like the porousness of your egg will affect your humidity. So, or sorry, how much humidity that egg needs. So if you're incubating multiple breeds in the same incubator, the humidity might be ideal for one breed, but not the other breed. So you do kind of sort of just have to figure that out as you go along. Um, older ducks will lay a more porous egg. Mm -hmm. So um, the older duck eggs, like say you had ducks that were four or five years old and you were incubating their eggs with a, a new layer, one or two year old duck, the older duck eggs are going to need a higher humidity in order to achieve the proper air cell size. The younger ducks would need a lower humidity. So it can be a little tricky if you are, are doing it with multiple ages. Um, we haven't noticed a huge difference when it comes to the age of the duck until they are like kind of over that five year old mark. So mm -hmm. basically five and under seems to be. Yeah, I don't think I have five. any over five for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, uh, keep your, keep a record. If you're going to do this yearly, you can learn a lot. If you just mm -hmm. mark down the breed, what humidity you used, what you went into lockdown at, how many went into lockdown, your hatch rate. And sometimes you might start to see a pattern, especially if you have multiple breeds. So if you have that wrote down with each incubation, it's just easier to notice if there is a pattern like the Pekin have great hatch rates and the Welsh aren't getting good hatch rates, then you can kind of, it can help you problem solve a little bit. Um, I guess that's, that's pretty much what, what I have. I know we talked about a lot more in the last uh, incubation, but lots of that come from the questions. Do, do you right. have any? Um, no, that was so much information, but in a good way. It was awesome. Okay. Um, and like, I love that every little thing to watch out for so that when I'm kind of doing my research and making my game plan, I'll kind of like, pay attention to all those little things that you mentioned for sure. So thank you. It was really awesome. It's hard to find other duck people. So, it is. <laughs> so I found that when I first started and everything, like everything's in the States and it's like, I have no idea what temperatures you're talking about or what your weather is like. Like I, you know, so it's nice to talk to someone who the climate's the same and we can access the same types of foods and that kind of thing for sure. So yes. This, speaking the same language right for <laughs> the conditions <laughs> it, it is hard and that's kind of why Heidi and I decided to start this like yeah. in spring we have so many people reaching out to us and it's not for sales well I mean we have our sales people too but lots of people are just looking for information they just yeah. they want to know what's normal what's not normal can I give them swimming water in the middle of winter? Do I have to cover the water? Is it going to kill them if they get in the water? Is like where in the States, they don't, most of them don't get nearly as cold as we do. So no. their practices are, are way different than us. They have different feed options. They like, so yeah, I get what you're saying. It's for sure. And just my location, like, I'm on the Canadian Shield. It's not really like farming territory around here. Like if you travel further, um, like Fort Fran Francis Emo area, they have 
like more farming stuff, but that's a few hours away. And then if you go into Manitoba, that's great, but that's a few hours away. So it's um, kind of hard right where we are. So Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I, I actually visit there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, my dad used to live there. In Kenora? Yeah, he used to live oh. there until he moved to Saskatchewan. Cool. <laughs> So I know exactly where you're at. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a weird location for sure, just uh, for this kind of stuff. And I finally got accepted into a Manitoba waterfowl group, which was nice because um, I don't mind traveling a few hours into Manitoba to you know pick up or do whatever I need to do. Um, but uh, it's just hard to find, and just not a lot of not a ton of duck people. <laughs> If you go further into Ontario, though, there should be quite a few waterfowl people out that way. There's, um... Yeah. Brad... Like, I... Brad with, um... Oh. Whoa. Waterfowl... Hang on, I'll actually find... So... Yeah, because he's on his, his page is called Willow Brook Waterfowl and Fiber. Okay. Um, he's he's a pretty well known breeder in Ontario. Yeah. Okay. But I think he's by Shelburne, if I remember yeah. okay. correctly. I'm not sure where that is. I think it's more south. I I could yeah, be wrong it though. Be south too. Um. Yeah. Um, but like I'm, we're still five hours from Thunder Bay, almost six hours from Thunder Bay, so we're very north up here. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think I, he's further. Like he's he's got to be pretty close to you. I think like maybe an hour or two. Like he's got to be down in that area somewhere. But um, he he has a lot of different waterfowl and um i follow his page i'm he has a whole bunch of different kinds of birds and stuff he yeah. works on breed standards and and stuff like cool. that uh, oh, neat. i know i know sometimes he sells hatching eggs and, and or offspring so yeah he might be one that would would be good for you to to follow or yeah for sure reach out to you yeah um, well thank you so much i'll probably be tuning into the next one if i can so that i can just absorb all of your knowledge <laughs> chat more ducks <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if if you ever have any questions outside of the topic like last time i think we ended up being on till like 10 o'clock oh wow that's awesome <laughs> yeah just talking and answering questions and yeah awesome. that's kind yeah. of what we do well, at least next week we'll have babies hatching yeah 